Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, welcome to the annual Copernicus lecture. My name is Geneviève Zubrzycki. I'm Associate Professor of Sociology and I'm, I'm the Director of the Copernicus Program in Polish Studies. Before we start uh, the lecture, I have a few things, some kind of housekeeping things to tell you and thanks also to give uh, to the organizers of this event. So first of all, I would ask everyone to please turn off your phone because it can be very disturbing to hear a beep or a ring during a lecture. And I want to tell you right away that we have, after the event, a reception with um, the troupe, Tert Usmagodnia, uh, to which you are cordially invited, and you leave on this side, and it's at the end of the corridor in the Walgreen Hall. Wow. Library? Wow. Lounge. The wow. Walgreen Lounge. Wow. Lobby. Wow. Whatever. Wow. There's a reception, there will be food. Just follow the crowd. Um, this was a very special semester uh, that we were able to offer our students and members of uh, the Polish community in Ann Arbor and Detroit, and also faculty. Uh, we were extremely pleased, very lucky, privileged to host uh, the Theater of the Eighth Day for over two weeks. And I want to say special thanks to the Department of Theater and Drama um, for organizing a course around the theater's um, presence, and especially Professor Vince Mountain, Professor Malcolm Tulip, and also Professor Priscilla Lindsay. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank also the Stamps uh, School of Art and Design for co-sponsoring tonight's event, more specifically, the Copernicus uh, Annual Lecture. And I will also uh, like to thank the Adam Mickiewicz Institute or the Institute, Adam Mickiewicz uh, Institute in Warsaw for making all of this contributing uh, generous funds to make it possible to bring the theater of the eighth day to Ann Arbor. Finally, a big thanks also um, to the one person on campus who can make it all happen, Marysia Ostafin. We're also very lucky to have her work with us on all of our programming. Um, and now I will uh, have Benjamin Paloff, who's Assistant Professor of Slavic Studies and Comparative Literature, to come and give the formal introduction to uh, today's speaker and to the theater. Thank you. Benjamin. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming. It, it gives me great pleasure to welcome all of you to the uh, annual Copernicus Lecture, which uh, has, has been uh, uh, a, a very large group effort involving many different units within the university, uh, uh, with who I, I hope will continue to work together. Uh, on future projects as well. The, when I'm thinking, uh, when, I'm, when I'm talking about welcoming you though, I'm also, um, I also wish to include uh, Teatr Usmegodnia, uh, Theater of the Eighth Day, a, a living legend, as it were, of Poland's post-war theater tradition, whose director, Eva Wojciak, will be our speaker today. It's, it's a slight departure from convention, uh, from the convention I am now engaged in, that of welcoming an audience to a guest presentation to lump the audience and the guest as one. And to add, as I would now have to, the me doing the welcoming, the sponsors only just mentioned, uh, those of you who might walk in, even as I'm saying this, only to realize that you've come through the wrong door and then you go and are out of my life forever or else you stay and just to see what it's about and what Eva Wojciak says changes your life forever. Uh, in effect, to say, let's all just be welcome here. Uh, we uh, are much more accustomed to the university lecture uh, following the precedent of our own theatrical tradition with its strict separation of stage and seating, actor and audience, representation in here and real life somewhere out there, 
But as anyone familiar with modern Polish theater knows, and as those of you uh, fortunate uh, to have seen the Theater of the Eighth Day's performances of The Files last week has now experienced firsthand, for that tradition generally, and for this acting company specifically, such neat compartmentalization will simply not do. One attends these performances in order to engage, not watch. To listen, certainly, but also to participate in the conversation that one enters with and that one takes with him or her when one leaves. Not to enjoy a temporary and, at any rate, illusory respite from so-called real life, public and private, but to enact it more fully, both publicly and privately. In some, not to be merely one, but one of many, as each of us is, as we, in fact, all are. Which also means knowing when to say no, to refuse to be subsumed into a comforting master narrative or political program. For these two things, the I and the we, go hand in hand. If public discourse in both the United States and Poland today teaches us anything, it is that taking part in the hard work of dialogue is not the same as throwing your lot with someone else's monologue, and that you cannot assert your own dignity simply by tearing away at the dignity of others. The point is not to join the party, whatever party, or on the other hand, to play Melville's Bartleby reflexively telling the world I would prefer not to until you starve to death. Whether in the theater or on the street, an engaged life means establishing boundaries and breaking them. And indeed, the title of today's lecture is Breaking Boundaries Before and After Censorship. The play The Files, uh, performed by the Theater of the Eighth Day last week, provides an excellent case in point. By performing excerpts of their own secret police files on stage, the actors of the Theater of the Eighth Day refuse both the communist authority's effort to lay claim to their lives, and at the same time, the post-communists' efforts to use their refusal to feed their own self-serving narrative. Eva Wojciak is the director of the Theater of the Eighth Day. She joined the group in the 1970s, has co-authored and staged uh, its most important uh, performances, including uh, How We Lived in Dignity, Wormwood, uh, and No Man's Land, and of course, uh, the, uh, the Files. Uh, she will be speaking shortly after uh, a brief uh, video program that will help us contextualize some of the work that they've been doing over the last decades and, uh, and at the University of Michigan. So uh, let's just watch the video, and then we can all feel welcome together.
when and how you should say no. A personal story. There exists a boundary of despair beyond which one does nothing but howl for redress, beyond which one kills. Every night I think about ways to get rid of a few guys from over there. What kind of goddamn earth is this where young women waste the nights sleeping through? Yes, those dreams enable me to live, enable me to accept each daily portion of hatred and despair. These words perfectly express my state of mind from those days, a uh, culmination of defiance against the surrounding world of socialist realism and against unlimited conformism. Opposition, rebellion, growing disgust, and a sense that everybody is taking part in keeping the lies alive, falsehood, otherness, all guided me towards some particular books. I read stories of rebels and revolutionaries, decembrists and urban guerrillas from Latin America. I was also interested in the terrorists from Western Europe, mostly Ulrike Meinhof and Gudrun Enslin from the Bader Meinhof group. On one hand, the novel terrorism of the Decembrists, where they killed a cruel oppressor like in an armed combat, putting one's life at stake. On the other hand, terrorism which took random innocent people as a victim. We were spending whole days and often also nights of discussion about how to fight totalitarianism and why it was acceptable. It was this prevailing social acceptance that forced us to think about tremor, shock and bombs. We wanted to scream, to be heard. We felt that we were droning and that no one was paying attention to the fact that all of us would soon reach the bottom together. In theater, inspired by the method of Plotowski, we rejected his alienation and contemptuous distance to our social reality and its heroes. Practicing the acting rule of the master, we wished to ecstatically change what was within our reach in the name of liberty, truth, and human dignity, the dignity of ordinary, plain citizen. Everyday reality quite soon made me and my friends face the necessity of defining how much we can sacrifice to defend our beliefs and choices. We were asked to sign a letter referring the amendments to the Constitution. It was our first spectacular encounter with the police. It was an ostent ostentatious entrapment. We were searched, interrogated, and intimidated. We saw what was hidden from the eyes of regular obliged citizens. We saw the backstage of social realism. Since that moment, we were to see it regularly. Our life began to be filled with the everyday small tasks and the conscious refusal to accept the shape of the world. A lot of minor social bustling around, modest gestures, such as spreading information, signing letters, and petitions. There was the famous case of the poet Stanislav Barancha, who was accused of bribery and dismissed from the university. We signed a letter in his defense and traveling around Poland, uh, we collected more signatures. Musicians working with us at the time refused to support the petition and consequently decided to leave the theater. They formulated a statement which, in my opinion, was an universal principle of opportunism. This is how it played out. One signature 
on a letter which would not change a thing shattered the great efforts of the theatre and killed a performance raising awareness of social problems that pointed to the truth about reality. One signature on a letter, a small thing versus artistic expressions, which was becoming successful. On one hand, a letter which probably did get a reply, and on the other, popularity and love of the times. Why is it that artists having the power to make crowds ecstatic so rarely use it to defend those who are persecuted. This, is, this question remains current even today and gains in significance when it has to be addressed to free people living in a democratic country. We rejected the simple equation, rightly suspecting that what lies behind it is calculation, concern for one's own career and a fear of failing into disgrace. It was already at the time when the foundation of our stance was taking shape and assumed unity of artistic <coughs> expression and my act of everyday life. It became our artistic credo. We believed that however dramatic and difficult the choice between values and opportunism may be, we must choose the former. The consequences of taking such a position have to be a decision of personal solitude, rejecting family, of not having children. In the theatre we fought for freedom and truth, so we find the persecution of the government an obvious consequence. Thus, in order to restrict the space of manipulation for those who, in any case, had influence on our lives, the theatre became the place for this child. In the following performances, we have to confine ourselves to what has been called paradise on earth, say for everyone how we live <coughs> in dignity. We reached for themes relating to reality. We asked about the ethical consequences of terrorism and about state terrorism at the same time demanding the human right to transcendence. We followed the democratic opposition developing in Poland at the time. We would sign petitions and letters, especially of the committee defending the workers. We would get involved in distributing underground press. The people from Kor became our mentors. They taught us and gave us support. It was thanks to them, that we were gaining more and more social awareness. We were conscious, uh, conscious that an important tool in the unequal fight with totalitarianism is a truth which you prove with your own self. The ability to openly say no in public seems to be a rare quality until now, proving one's social maturity. One has to constantly cultivate because the temptations of conformism appear in every reality. Conformism tends to hide also beneath the act of yielding to civil community. We realized this during martial law when we were deprived of the right to exist and to perform. It was forbidden to write about us. We were pushed to the margins sentenced to civil death. For almost 10 years, we couldn't leave the country, even though it was a particularly popular time for our performances around the world, and we kept getting a great number of invitations. During that peri period, the only free space for artists like us were churches. In churches, church rooms and yards, we performed for two years. The performances were presented that not related to religion in any way. But still we entered a world in which borders between art, political manifestation, and religious manifestation would often blur. We would hang a black curtain on the altar. It didn't bother anyone, even though the audience was often those very people 
who used to come there only for mass. For us, the theatre artists who seemed to be fated to performing for elitist audience, used to experimental and intellectually ambitious formats, the experience of performing in churches for working class people was fascinating and inspiring. We had a feeling that those who were coming to see our shows, and the majority had not been viewers of any other theatre, understood perfectly the language of our performances, deciphered the signs and interpreted metaphoric messages, because they were free from the cliches of interpretation, and thus empathic and open. We were then calling ourselves an avant-garde folk theatre. And we had a lot of proof that such a performance as Wormwood, The Rise and The Small Apocalypse reached audience who felt that they are the protagonists. So initially everything indicated that there was a chance for interesting exchange between artists and people related to the church, it worked according to an unwritten agreement to fight the totalitarian regime together. Over the course of time, it was the theater that would conquer sacrality, because it began to, to be taken over by national, patriotic, and religious rituals. This wall all brought about the elite because it was actually the artist and not the church going on community uh, and the anti-communist opposition which took up the pathetic romantic tone. More often that, than not, the border between theater performance and the performance as a part of public manifestation would blur. On many occasions, just after the show, the song God Save Poland was chanted accompanied by raising one's finger in a gesture of victory. We formed an exotic underground culture which would more and more strongly refer to simplifying in black and white nationalistic and patriotic emotions. When I watch footage of marches with torches, protests of the defenders of the cross, I think that, in fact, it was at that time, during martial law, that such an attitude was forming, but was never discussed, since the opposition didn't discuss, but rather joined forces, cherished unity and strength. I had the feeling that we didn't do enough then, that we didn't explicitly express our position, that our no to the patriotic and Catholic emotions was too weak. Moreover, we never opposed the artistic kitsch, which was an <coughs> inevitable part of it. The years of work in theatre with Magonia allowed me to understand that one can become independent from police terror, from constraints and the terrifying interior towards it, only by creating values, expanding one's inner freedom and exploring spirituality. After a couple of years of my adventure with theatre, which was supposed to be like dropping bombs, I was forced to leave the country. I received a passport with a stamp allowing me to cross the border only one way. I joined my friends who had left a year before for I still had the feeling that what we were saying was significant and the power of our message is very closely linked to this particular theme of people. For two years, we were constantly traveling throughout Europe and we performed true to our beliefs and values. We shared them with the people of the West. With our somber world, we entered into a stable reality. Sometimes we came across voices criticizing us for imposing a sense of guilt on the audience. Perhaps 
that was the case. At the time, we already believed that Western Europe was not so guilty, but rather shared the responsibility for Soviet totalitarianism. We also had a strong conviction of having some duty regarding the fates of people. The events of 1989, it's possible for us to come back to Poland, made it possible to come back us to Poland. An official invitation arrived from the first government of free Poland, from its leader, Tadeusz Mazowiecki. The year 1989 changed our geopolitics paradoxically. The border of civilization, a kind of Berlin Wall, moved to the eastern border of Poland. We suddenly found ourselves in the role of a guardian whose task was to tighten the border of the Western world. I realized that quite soon, just as the first wave of enthusiasm about regaining freedom subsided. I was also aware that a sudden promotion from a prisoner to an officer tends to be dangerous for other prisoners. This is why in the performance, the Porter's Lodge, we decided it's very urgent to pose questions about this change. We asked about memory, conscience, and empathy, which is a result of our own experience for 40 years in captivity have made us sensitive to these values, or maybe had it accidentally happened the other way around. Had we become thoughtless and callous towards suffering, wars, and poverty outside our borders? I thought that getting our, our freedom back, entering the camp of the democratic <coughs> countries of the West, is a gift which is an obligation motivating us to act for the sake of those who are still far from their goals. It was obvious to us that we had to raise these issues in our performances and get involved in everyday activity, activity of the real world. We created an intellectual space for pondering multiculturalism and the problems of the alienated, which were consequence of political transformation, at the same time organizing emergency aid to people from countries at war. Most, uh, of, all, uh, most uh, of all from Chechnya who were forced to abandon their homes. We performed in refugee camps, we invited them to our residence in Poznan, so they should share their experiences and show the genuine, genuine picture of the world. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, when freedom and democracy had set in Poland, we were often asked at home and abroad if theatre committed to political and social issues still has any purpose in the new reality, since together we with the fall of communism, the enemy ceased to exist. Conformism, conformism, egocentrism, calculation soon defeated empathy and social sensitivity. Therefore, the artists who believe that art has some obligation towards those who are losing, suffering, weaker, had no reason for inner immigration. Today, I still cannot find any justification for abandoning or even modifying, uh, modif modifying the attitude and belief which was formed 30 years ago, that the artist as a creator and a human being ought to serve people, lighten up the dark side of existence <coughs> and sympathize. Simultaneously, democratic transformation in Poland was strengthening. We joined the European Union. Gradually, we took on new assignments and recognized the democratization of the state. People's lives were improving, even though there were great differences in the access to goods, which is a consequence of democratization. After 40 years of false silence, 
people awaken with desire to manifest their beliefs and convictions. From the corners of our experience, the demons of nationalism and Catholic faith, anti-Semitism and hatred uh, repealed. One of the battle zones is now the subject of cooperation with the secret service during communist times of the PRL. The content of secret files started to be used as a weapon in fighting political opponents. Deficient archival resources making it impossible to complete the knowledge of the time began to serve in the pursuit of humi humiliating and destroying people. We produced the files, a performance based on documents concerning us, which had been gathered by the Secret Service and also from our private text and fragments of scripts. By using the device, we once again could tell a story of the values which formed us which we believed in and in defense of which we have risen until now. We also expressed our views outside the theater. One such a moment was the act of sending back formal awards and medals which President Lech Kaczynski had decorated us with and who later condescendingly excluded the hero of the 68th, Adam Michin, from celebrating the anniversary of <coughs> those events. The wheel of history has turned. It has been 20 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall and more than 60 since the passing of the General Declaration of Human Rights. The ruling political power still has a tendency to be, to be <coughs> totally possessive and to mistake its role as a civil servant <coughs> with that of a despotic feudal ruler. The people still submissively allow this and it's therefore the task of the artist to protect human spirit, spirituality and freedom, both in art as well as in art. And if you wouldn't mind saying your name, and the discussion for the discussion. Uh, I have a question. When you said that now you feel that maybe in the times when you were giving performances in the church, that you didn't emphasize your separateness enough, is that um, kind of a political statement where you're interpreting that alliance during martial law as a reason um, concerning the current role of the Catholic Church in Poland, where that alliance, according to a lot of people, has turned out to be very costly. Uh, as far as I can uh, answer you in English, <laughs> I'd like to say that uh, the Catholic Church, which has now an incredible influence on our reality uh, is, a, uh, is beneficent, is just uh, uh, beneficent of, 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 the, of this uh, time of the martial law. So uh, we were, um, 
one of uh, one of few artists who were independent in this church, um, so-called underground uh, cultural life. Uh, most of the people started uh, in that time to, I mean, with this uh, uh, all this nationalistic, romantic uh, uh, declaration, manifestation, which which now I think are very alive on the streets uh, among these defenders of the cross. It's now a little bit uh, more grotesque. But uh, the roots are, in my opinion, in that time. I don't know if I answer you. Let's go to party. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question. It's a follow-up to Kasha's question. So in the 1980s, when you were performing in churches and at one point in your lecture you said we were, our no was too weak. Were you, during martial law and the years following, already seeing the seeds of what is going on now? No. <coughs> no. No, but you know, it happens sometimes that uh, we felt bad in situ sometimes in the situations when our performances, for example, was we just perform our ordinary shows. And after shows, sometimes without any break, people were clapping and going fluently to singing this uh, religious song about the God Save Poland and making this gesture. So we were confused a little bit. Uh, but what to do, I mean, what to do with the people? with the people who are coming, uh, who are crying, uh, what to do with them, how to explain them that we are a little bit different, that this, what we say, is a little bit more complicated than only the demonstration of being anti-communism and believers. We are not believers. So I think we were too weak, but... Uh, but there was a strong yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Justin. I'm curious what your situation is today in post I mean, where, what are you doing? What kind of threats do you see before you or do you? Uh, how are you being perceived by the new reality? No, we are, we are, of course, joining all the demonstrations which are going on now in, in big Polish towns, uh, including Poznań, uh, against this uh, new government and against this uh, nationalistic uh, uh, ideas. Uh, we, we try to, to make, uh, like, all our life <laughs> This space, which is free for free thoughts, uh, but but it looks bad now. I mean that uh, I don't know what what will happen if if it's enough to make all the time these manifestations, which are peaceful manifestations. Uh, sometimes I think that. Um, Maybe uh, something much worse will happen in future. I mean that people start to create kind of not a civil war, but but also the kind of rallies and cold war. Cold war, because they, I mean, it doesn't change nothing. Our manifestations, even even if we are, I don't know, fifteen thousands. Uh, this government took public media and they now uh, do such a propaganda like in Stalinism time. So they say in this uh, public television that there was few people, just uh, something between 15 and 30. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to be continuing the thread of the conversation, but 
you had mentioned in your talk, in your lecture, that one of the crucial outcomes of being pushed further underground was the um, perhaps unforeseen opportunity to engage working class audiences who were not accustomed to theater. And, and it would seem that you benefited from their not having great preconceptions of what theater is supposed to be. Uh, I wonder whether, or I, I wonder, I guess I'm, I'm asking whether this could carry over into, uh, whether there are any plans to carry this over into the countryside and smaller towns today in Poland, where, the, uh, where that seems to be where we see a very strong cultural divide between the ideals of an open society and the ideals of a nationalist or romantic um, whether, it, it, much as that was the case in the early 1980s, it, this is now the time to leave those cities where you have these big manifestations and to go to places where no go one knows to, who you are. Go to say. Mm. <coughs> you are right. Uh, it's strange because we, uh, um, we are used to perform in small towns because we do also very big uh, outdoor shows, uh, and we we still experience it that uh, that such a people who never go to theatre, who are just uh, uh, ordinary, plain citizens, they are very good audience. If you don't make any propaganda pressure on them, you can talk to them, and they are really very um, open mind. But of course, we, we do <laughs> we do what we can, but of course it's we are limited also, and uh, unfortunately we are still um, few people who are offering this kind of art, which is universal, which is anti-nationalistic, uh, and. I am interested in knowing your opinion, uh, two things, uh, present regarding uh, what's going on in Poland regarding government there, in terms of, uh, you know, what it seems to be the drive in just as a nationalistic culture or is it more perhaps a genetic tradition? And, and uh, you know, how does that fit in with this open how open they want to be, you know, you know, in terms of refugees from all over, or just people wandering around Europe, or, or you know, what, what does that openness mean precisely in uh, both the movements of people and the state of people in the various places? And I also wondered if, if, if in the past, if in the 1970s, for example, if you heard what, if you heard it all, or what sort of uh, things you heard about what were going on in the USA regarding things like COVID health growth, you know what that is, for example. We, we had a lot of different uh, types of theater here from like, that period of living theater, for example, which we went back to that. There's, you can bet others, you know, time flows, for example, different trends. I wonder what, if anything was heard in Poland about these USA theater trends. I need some help. <laughs> so one question was about the limits of openness, right? One part of the question was about, you, you preach you want openness, but how much openness can there be on the one hand? Um, and whether uh, the current government is, is a passing affair that's nationalist, or if it's, and I, I assume you were trying to be controversial by saying it's kind of embedded in Polish culture. Well, and genetics. And genetics, that's what it is. Yeah, genetics. That's the controversial part. <laughs> Czyli jak, jaka jest różnica, czy, czy ten rząd jest tylko nacjonalistyczny, czy to... Czy, 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 czy to jest... 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 Czy to j
in my opinion, it's a uh, problem of genetics. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> I always say that po po Polish people are... Uh, jakby konserwatywnymi, czy są genetycznymi konserwatystami. Genetic conservatists. It's my opinion, I mean, it's, it's my personal story. <laughs> but, but it is something in it. So for ages we have uh, this uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, we, jak, jak, jak jest mieszczaństwo po angielsku? Middle class. This, uh, uh, we were bourgeoisie, we, towns, the culture of big towns, we were very feudal society for, for ages. And I think that uh, there are also consequences of it, that uh, these ages we, we just can, can't throughout like, like this. Uh, so I don't know if, uh, of course, my English is not enough to to probably to, to present it in a more complicated way, but uh, I think it's something very deep in us that we are ready, I mean, our society to now to, to support this government and all this anti-Semitic, nationalistic, very um, conservative. What do you say? Only 20%. <laughs> maybe 20 percent only maybe <laughs> Kevin <laughs> hi, hi. Uh, question that's very open could you just talk about the uh, experience that you had with the opening that was just very fulfilling or rewarding in some way one of your cherished memories of creation Tri? Jakieś... Yeah, I think we, all of us, uh, my friends are sitting over there, uh, we, have, we spent uh, all our life in, f that our f dreams were fulfilling. I mean, we are the story with happy end. <laughs> because it looked sometimes, especially in the 70s, in 80s, that our life is over. I mean, that we know everything what will happen because nothing will happen, because we are just in our country like in prison. Uh, 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 there was uh, very few people in opposition in Poland, in Poznań, uh, like one of these uh, secret associates uh, uh, is reporting. There was something like 40 people in opposition this is a town of, uh, with uh, 500,000 people. <laughs> so uh, we had very often feeling that we are in a grave forever, that we never change anything, that the life will be every day the same. This socialism was so grey, also in aesthetic sense. And we were dreaming about to go to Mexico, to, to feel the taste of the world, to, so, and everything uh, happened in our life. I mean, it took time, we suffered a lot, but, you know, at last we are here. <laughs> so we had a lot of, a lot of wonderful experiences, a lot of um, beautiful meetings with uh, the best people in, uh, in the world, in, in very different countries. We could help to a lot of people. We had, uh, we are like realizowanymi artistami. Uh, but of course, again, we now in um, confrontation to next step of the revolution. I, I have to confess that I feel tired. But it's uh, wonderful to see you, like, I mean, your group, and also the Polish students, that new generation is going to fight for new reality, because I think that the world is somewhere on the crossroads, not only in Poland, but also uh, in America. So we have to do a lot. You, the, you have, your, 
uh, election now is a big challenge for, for you. So we are paradoxically in a quite similar uh, situation, I think. That, mm, I'm probably telling something. <laughs> No, to ja już nie widzę pytań, to... What about the, 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 the question, this, the other question you had, about the influences of American theater, were they, did you recognize, did you see, did you, were you aware of theater, in, in, for example, in the 1970s in the U.S., was there any influence, was there any, any, uh, any impact at all? Of course, leaving theater, open theater, there were some American groups which were very much bread and puppet. Uh, we knew them and we were very close to them and they were very important for our also uh, work and for our experiences, artistic and also intellectual. Thank you for...